Ladies and gentlemen, from Addison, Alabama, a full service blues band since 1962, James Harmon! Hey now, this is Nathan James. I've been James Harmon's guitarist since I was 19 years old and joined the band and became a dangerous gentleman's in about 1998. And I've been very fortunate to get to travel and tour the world with James and he's taken me along on some wonderful adventures that, uh, you know, I'll always remember and cherish for my whole life. Uh, just, yeah, just hanging out with him is, uh just an education it's, it was really fun we both grew up with similar childhoods you know our fathers were civil servants his father was a motorcycle cop and uh mine was a fire chief you know so uh we kind of grew up in similar ways you know we grew up around similar uh, role models and mm -hmm. we had similar stories as kids you know so at all the harmonica blowdowns i was with him there backstage and we'd go in the dressing room and we'd hang out together but it was a great guy. Wow. Him. James knew that whatever I was playing, I was playing the blues and I was playing his songs mm. and supporting his stories. Mm. Because that's how I always saw James as a, as a storyteller. His line, his lineage, I always saw it goes all the way back to that caveman, you know, in front of a fire with this shadow being cast on the wall, telling mm -hmm. stories. And uh, with James, that's where he was coming from, uh, kind of a universal storyteller, using his music and the blues as a means to do that. You know, he, he'd been in that, he... He'd done a lot of gigs in Florida and he'd done a lot of gigs in the Southeast and he traveled a lot. And of course, he did a lot of gigs over, overseas, you know, uh, they loved him in Europe. And so, you know, I think he's done gigs in like 33 different countries. James was a true original. He was a guy that just, he epitomized that whole blues vibe and took it to another place. So, you know, being from Alabama, he, he just had his country ways, but at the same time he was, he was just an original, but he just was so steeped in the real traditions of the blues. So I first heard about uh, James uh, just, you know, in the pipeline. And I went to go see him one time. And that was the one time I got to see him. The first time I saw him was the first time uh, and only time I got to see him with a classic band with Hollywood Fats and Ramos. And uh, Richard Innes was the drummer and uh, Willie J on the bass and it was just something like I couldn't believe. So I'm going, this is just, you know, it's just was so alive and so cool. And James was the ringleader of this, this, this amazing group of people. And what a great band leader. He just like was singing and band leading. And I think that my my favorite memory is is when he would record with us, and he uh, having James Harmon in the studio while you're recording is is just like having your mentor egging you on from behind the control panel, and making funny faces and 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 uh, you know it, it was always good to have him there. You know that that's the thing I could say. James was just so supportive in that way. If he liked you, it was. Uh, it was easy. It was an easy hang, you know. Anytime I'm driving late at night, I think of James Harmon because he and I have spent some time doing so, and it's uh, it's just a fun. It's just like his spirits there when I'm driving long distances, and every time I see that moon, you know, he he sings a lot of songs about the moon, and uh, Lonesome Moon Trance is one of the one of my favorite records that he did, and one of my favorite songs that he's done, and all the great players that he's hired over the years. He uh, he really had an influence on me, how to run a band and hire the very best guys that you can and uh, keep it light, keep it interesting and fun and uh, have a good time at it, you know? So that's what, that's that's what James Harmon is about for me.
and we we loved that guy. There was a place in my heart for him always, no matter what band I was in. I always gave him respect and let people know that that's where I started and that was my mentorship. And, and I never I never would forget that. You know that that he really gave me that start. And I I, I told him I said there wouldn't be any Kid Ramos without you. you know? He said well. He said, you honored the gift. You had a gift and you honored the gift. And uh, that that meant a lot. And uh, he's gonna be missed, you know, by a lot of people, man, that, that knew him like I knew him. And and he was he was one of a kind. He was a character and a half and uh, God bless James Harmon. And he had so many stories to tell that, you know, could fill several books in stories like, you know, hanging out with Otis Redding on his tour bus and going to see Bobby Blue Bland and J little Junior Parker being the only white face in the audience in the early 60s and just like crying as he'd be watching this amazing music go down and uh, you know it was just a heavy experience getting to travel with James and spend so much time with him you know really shaped my music identity and really taught me a lot of things in life in general you know Harmon um, always told stories and um, seemed to enjoy himself coming into the radio station finally after saying no, 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 no. But I was very happy that we became friends. James Harmon was, uh, boy, what a gentleman. What a great guy. Um, he was he was one of the first people that uh, our little group of musicians met that was um he was older than all of us by a, a couple years and he had been around the block a few times and he'd had bands and he'd made records and he had a marvelous record collection like i said and he was a real wheeler and dealer horse trader he always had guitars and amplifiers and oh he worked at orange county speaker repair he he could build speaker cabinets it wasn't anything james couldn't do and he lived in orange county so it was a a little bit of a trip to go down into Costa Mesa to go, to go hang out with James, and it was always rewarding. And he was, um, but because he was the older blues man, he helped point us in the right direction. Uh, Dave Alvin's first guitar was a uh, was purchased by James Harmon for Dave Alvin. It was a thrift store special, you know, a Mustang, a Fender Mustang. Yeah, the gigs are one thing, you know, we all love doing gigs together and being on stage is fun and all, but with James Harmon, it was about the hang before and after and on the way to the gigs. I, you know, you got much more out of that with him than actually doing the gigs. The gigs were the easy part, you know, but, but getting to them and lugging all the gear in and dealing with electronics and gear, that, that's a hassle. And uh, he, he was fun to hang out with while you're trying to do all that stuff. So it's always just fun sitting in the car, watching everyone run around and just talking. That he's uh, one, of the, one of the last guys that, you know, had that bond between the older cats and who is now out there playing. He was kind of like one of those middlemen guys that got to see it all. You got sure. to play with all those cats. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really, you know, am fond of the opportunity that I had with James. He was a good man. He was a, like a father figure to us. And he was a contemporary, but he was, he had all the experience. And he had the bands. He always had a great band. He had a band that had Bill Bateman, Phil Alvin, Willie J. Campbell, and James Harmon that became the Blasters. <laughs> Deal with a deal with James Harmon is that we played a lot of gigs in bars to, to make our money, but then every once in a while we would go up and do head we would do opening spots like at Madame Wong's West or the Roxy, and the little drum just wasn't working. The 22 inch drum wasn't working so well, so I went to the local music store and we went in the basement and we found this old drum and. It was pretty big, but it was the coolest one. So I had this Ludwig Blue Sparkle 32 by 16 inch bass drum. And uh, when I 
first brought it to rehearsal at James's house, I rolled it in the front door and everybody started laughing. And then I dove on top of the drum <laughs> and I rolled over in front of the drum and did a somersault. And then we all had a good laugh. And I took a lot of heat, you know, all over the world for that large drum, but um, I still stand by it. I have one right there. A lot of times the, the songs we would play at a gig at night, or at least some of them, would be what happened that day. We were on the road and James and I, both being from the South, have a affinity for grits. Mm -hmm. But we ordered them in the wrong place, somewhere in Oregon or Washington. <laughs> we ordered grits and they were, we got these runny bowls of grits. And just sacrilege as far as any grit eater goes. But we got to the gig and we we're about halfway through this song that I'd never heard of before. And he starts singing about runny grits. <laughs> and we did probably a 10 minute song about getting runny grits and, uh, you, you know, and, and, and uh, the foolishness of ordering grits in a Denny's, <laughs> at least in a Denny's in Washington, you know. But yeah, but if it wasn't for Barry, I wouldn't have met James. That's life changing.